Hey everybody, it's Cinnamon Cooney, your archer, but and today we are going to be going over the magic of how you pick colors or in our theory color schemes. So as artists, one of the things that we have to do is choose what colors we're going to use when we're doing a painting. And when you're a beginner, that can be pretty challenging to do. I know the years that I have been online, having students that are new to painting has really helped me learn how to explain these concepts in simplified terms. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to be going through all the color schemes a beginner needs to know. Now on the mic is my husband, John. Hello. He is going to be helping me bring this really kind of cool class to you. I know it's going to be a little academic, but we're going to keep it fun. It is going to be hands on. I'm going to demo what I'm talking about. I think when this is explained to you and broken down, you're going to find that these terms and these concepts you have some natural sense of, you just needed to be able to put a word or a process to figuring out. We are gonna be using our handy dandy color wheel today. And the color wheel is a wonderful tool because it helps us locate our color schemes. So whether it's a tetradic color scheme or split complementary color scheme, you don't have to have those memorized. The color wheel actually organizes that information for you. And it'll do this on the CMYK color wheel or on the regular old timey old school color wheel. So either one, but I'm gonna be using the color wheel color wheel to be doing this today. I've got my paint colors out, thalo green, thalo blue, cad red, cad yellow, lemon yellow, hand suck, quinacridone magenta, deoxazine purple, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, mars black, titanium white, and yellow ochre because we're gonna be going over the basic color schemes. Now we're gonna be doing, this is live, and if you have a question, put it all in caps. We're going to be doing the Q&A part of this when this is over. I am answering questions about the color schemes we are covering today because these are the core color schemes that as a painter, we all have to know. I'm not gonna be going into more advanced color schemes today. I'm gonna break that into a separate video at another time. But this is just the starting point that we all have to begin at. So we're gonna call this like color schemes or magic of color schemes number one. Color schemes are just the colors that you put together. If you think of like a design board where they have the little swatches from the photograph, that's a color scheme. Those are the color schemes in that. And the words we're using are gonna just be the language of those color schemes. So when I'm talking to another person about it, I have a way of expressing the choices that I made in a painting, or I have a way of organizing my thoughts about what I wanna do about a painting. And it's really actually very helpful. Uh, I know I know you guys like for years have been asking me like what what colors do I use? This is the answer to that. This is how you pick what colors you want to use. How are you doing today, babe? Good. All right. So you guys are a lucky group to be coming in. I'm going to start out with my T-square and we're going to break down the first two color schemes. I am just so you guys know I'm on the um, this, and this is, we have this actually at the store, I think. Um, this is the 1264 Fabriano pad. Um, it is multimedia. It is 120 pound, nine by 12. I really like it for this type of work. I wish I'd had it when I did the big art quest. It is right now my favorite little multimedia pad for this type of work. So if you guys are wondering, and we have it in the store, I believe. I do, we, I do. Yeah. We can go into all that later on. So if you're looking for it, we has it. I'm just making a couple lines so I can organize my thoughts and know what I'm talking about. So the first color schemes, and let's put up a step so we can organize this later um, in what we're doing, are achromatic and monochromatic. Often used incorrectly, probably even by me if I'm distracted. And that's because they are similar and yet distinctly different. Don't ignore my spelling. It's just for my reference later. <laughs> I don't have a spelling show. <laughs> Monochromy. I use this Google spell check for my spelling. If everything is spelled correctly, uh, somebody that's a creature. proofread it or I use Google spell check. A monochromy. That's a little creature. Monochroma that lives monochromatic. I should add the T there. All right, T. So um, a lot of times you'll hear artists like use achromatic and monochromatic interchangeably, and they're really not. Achromatic, very simply, and let's make an achromatic color scheme. I'm gonna use a nice little bright brush, this is number eight, Simply Simmons, is a black and white color scheme. It has no color. So sometimes when people are thinking about uh, a monochromatic color scheme, they'll say achromatic, or when they're doing a black and white color scheme, they think it's monochromatic. And a little bit it is, but really, I'm gonna just work out little 
shades here so you can see it. The reason that we're going to the trouble, and I hope you're doing this with me and building your book with me, is that later when you go to reference this concept or idea, you will have these visual cues to remind you. So black and white is an achromatic color scheme. Monochromatic can be any hue. Remember the, that term? It's any hue or any color except the black and white. So I could do a monochromatic blue. I could do monochromatic red. I could do monochromatic purple. Let's do a monochromatic blue. I think it's a pretty common one. So I'm going to come here. That is when you do a painting and you only use uh, the color and white. Sometimes you can kind of get away with using black to shade it, right, if you want to, but basically it is one color for all of the values. So you're doing a value study, you're making your lights and darks, but you're just using one color. And the nice thing about a monochromatic color scheme and the reason why artists choose it is that it can be very calming and very harmonizing on a canvas, right? So when you're trying to do something that maybe has a uh, really dynamic lights and darks, but you also want to make it kind of calming and peaceful. A monochromatic color scheme is that. So I could do any color and just by lightening it with white, and I can kind of technically darken it with black. I would and still refer to it as monochromatic. It wouldn't make it achromatic. I could make any painting and that can be really nice and there's some very famous paintings out there that are done in a monochromatic um, color scheme. All right. And so when you're looking on the wheel, the outside edge here, this grayscale, that's your achromatic. And your monochromatics are in this range on your wheel, right? Where it shows you the lights, the tint tone shade, and it's got the colors. That would be your monochromatics, even if they don't mean to it. But remember, they will absolutely um, tell you this and it has the definition on harmonious color schemes over here just in case you have any trouble remembering it like any tint tone shade of just one color so through here right through here through here so that's how you would use that color wheel as another visual reminder okay oh it's joe miski uh, hi <laughs> it's been a minute <laughs> Just, sometimes you run into members of your community and you get so excited to see them. Okay. All right. So we're going to go on to the next step. All Remember, right. if you've got questions, put them all in caps. We're going to take the Q&A at the end of the show because we've got a lot to go through. And this is going to let us get to our color mixing class because there's no point in doing all the other color mixing until you kind of understand what's going on here. So let's make another couple of spaces. And I need a new step. Okay. This not completely straight line, is going to be an analogous color scheme. I love analogous. Now, when you're painting with kids, I always put out analogous colors because kids want to mix all the colors together whenever they're painting. And one of the ways that you can prevent them from getting a muddy painting while still allowing them to create in a very free spirit is you put out analogous colors. Let's talk about what that means. That means colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. So like you could do red, violet, red, red, orange. You could do violet, red, violet, red. Just kind of three little colors next to them. Sometimes you can kind of stretch it out, right? But what you're really wanting to do, and we'll even look here, is like using colors that are adjacent to each other on the color wheel, use at least two, but no more than five consecutive colors. So if you were to do an analogous painting you could do as little as red orange orange or red red orange or you could do violet red red orange orange everything in there in that painting you could also have the tint tone shades of that as well so you actually have a lot of choices in an analogous painting one of my very favorite analogous works is in the blue green blue ranges where like all the way to violet through green is a really beautiful, harmonious, good color scheme. Um, analogous color schemes tend to have a lot of harmony. So let's put one of those together. Let's do our, our violet. So let's go violet, blue, violet, blue, blue, green, green. Shall we do that? That'll be a fun color scheme. 
that we will do. Okay, we're going to go like this. We got our little thing up. So I'm going to take my little purple out. Now, because dioxazine is such a, a visibly dark paint and often reads as a chromatic black, that's a color that appears black but is not black. All right. So we're here, we've got violet, and then I can come here and go blue-violet, right? So I'm mixing my ultramarine in there. It's a nice little addition. That's pretty next to that. See how those are pretty next to each other? That's very, very pretty. And then we can do blue. And I might even mix my phthalo blue and my ultramarine for this transition. So you could switch two types of pigments of blue. Let's add a little white to it so we can really see it. You could switch in your pigments, but you're still being analogous or harmonious on the color wheel. So there's still some creativity that you get to play with, right? So then we're going to have blue, green, green. So blue, green, I could make some turquoise here to get to a blue green. Well, that's lovely, isn't it? It can even be a little more green. This is a wonderful set of color schemes for like an ocean, a cool painting, working in shadows. So by using this limited kind of color set, I can actually, I'm gonna add a little yellow to my green because I want it to be a brighter green than my phthalo green just so you guys can see that it can be a brighter green. So that's still a color harmony because those are still next to each other, right? On that color wheel, I think I am gonna go stay, stay in phthalo, I like that better. All right, so that's what they're talking about in a color harmony or analogous color scheme, right? So, all right, I'm gonna sip my coffee now. My brain is a cooking. Is your brain a cooking? It is, I'm, well, I'm listening. Um, I, have, I have so many thoughts, I'm going to save them to the end. So all of these are considered, uh, all, har all these color schemes that we're doing are a type of color harmony, the, but the most harmonious are the monochromatic, achromatic, and analogous. As you start to work in different areas around the color wheel, it still has harmony, but now it's a more complex harmony. It's not like, you know, when a bunch of voices sort of blend together, like Celtic women. <laughs> And you're like, oh, yeah. kind of that sort of thing. All right. How are we doing? Are we doing good? Yeah. Excellent. I'm going to sip my coffee and we're going to move on to our next color scheme. I know we've got a It'll lot next step. of color. Yeah. We're going to go into our next step. To my very favorite, almost often used color scheme. This, and you've heard us talk about it a lot is a complementary color scheme. Complementary colors are colors that are on opposite ends of the color wheel, right? So you're talking about um, like violet and yellow. Just so you know, dioxazine purple is actually really a yellow green on its complement, but for this purposes, we're just gonna do purple and yellow. We're gonna simplify it. So purples to yellows right is that and you can find that on a color wheel look what it does it lets you know red violet to yellow green and if i move the wheel this part of the wheel yellow to violet i can move here and what if i wanted to have i could have yellow orange to blue or just orange to blue like orange to blue is a complementary color scheme some things we know about complementary colors what happens when we mix complementary colors together so if i take purple right and like say I take this purple and I take my cad yellow and I mix them together it desaturates and creates kind of a brown gray doesn't it remember that I okay, see it as we work it in there it just pulls it out of either the yellow or the purple it's not really a brown brown but it is a grayed when you get it on the white paper, you can really see how desaturated that is. So that's one of the things that happens when we work complementary colors together. We can desaturate the colors. Also, visually, complementary colors tend to vibrate or play to our eyes a little bit. We get into that sort of color field that we were talking about. You guys remember the color fields? Painting 
Yeah. In our upcoming acrylic April. So I'm going to pull a little bit up here. So that scheme would look something like there's the purple. I'm going to rinse out thoroughly and I'm going to show you all the little colors we're going to do in between. Here's the yellow. I could have maybe some yellow and white. I could have a mix of yellow, white, and purple and white. Right, so we can have those half mixes available where we mix a little yellow into the purple or a little purple into the yellow. Let's say I wanted to do a very, very light purple. That would be in a complementary color scheme. Come over here and maybe kind of gray a yellow with a little bit of that white. And no, I don't want any red. Maybe this is a little more yellow. So this here is a complementary color scheme. We're working with purple and yellow complementary colors and all the tint tone shades and intermixes between the two of them in between. Now in complementary painting, a lot of times what artists will do is they will use almost entirely a true complement. And then we might like kind of fudge by bumping over into a yellow orange or into a yellow green a little bit to expand the range. It's not technically a spit complement because we're still using the complementary color, but we do sometimes as artists kind of pull here and pull there. It still works as a complementary color painting because we're leaning on the predominant color of the violet and yellow. Another thing to know, if most of your color scheme is say violet, and then you add just a little bit of yellows in an area, you create a focal point to that part. If all of the painting is yellows, right? Um, uh, and a monochromatic, most of the painting is monochromatic in the yellow, but then in an area you really, really push the purple, then you're gonna notice that very, very much. It's gonna pull the eye. Van Gogh did this a lot in his color schemes, pulling a lot of colors into an area and then using a complement or spit complement of it to pull our eyes. So this is just something when you're looking at paintings and you're thinking about paintings, you're like, why does this work? Like next time you're at the museum or you're even looking at nature, sometimes nature will give you this stuff in a sunset or in a natural scape. You know, I can't tell you how many times like in an iris is I'll see this as a complimentary. The gardener, gardeners will use these color theories to plant a garden. If you're wanting to have a more exciting garden, you can use these color schemes to create drama in your garden. In your clothes, in everything. Oh my goodness, now we're going to be getting into it. All right, let's do... We're going to do the split complement and then the triadic and tetradic. All right. Um, um, sip coffee, heat coffee, step. Ah, <laughs> uh, art school. <laughs> but this is what we're talking about. In a hands-on way, this is what we're talking about. If I'm looking at a sunset that has a lot of purple and yellow in it naturally, I can lean into a complementary color scheme to create more drama in that painting. If I am looking at a sunset that is reds and yellows and oranges, I can lean into an analogous color scheme to create a harmony and peacefulness within that painting. You know, if I'm wanting to create kind of a soft, almost even melancholy sometimes, right? Kind of scheme within a painting. I can lean into monochromatic, but sometimes the world, like if you think about it, winter tends to be very monochromatic. It, it, as it Naturally, as a landscape, winter landscapes lean into monochromatic spaces very well. So that's something to just be thinking about, you know, generally. And when we're doing um, acrylic April, you will see these color schemes be used often to create interest. And in fact, when you're doing abstract work, not just figurative work, but especially abstract work, you have to really have your color schemes together 
because that's so much of what your painting is going to lean on. It's going to lean on color theory uh, more than almost anything else. And understanding color theory, knowing that, you know, the color orange and blue are complementary, you know then, and I'll put this out here so you can kind of see this, they vibrate against each other. I'm going to put a little bit there. I'm going to make some nice orange. I'm going to take my cad red and my cad yellow to make a nice little orange. All right, so when we have a nice orange like this, and then we want to uh, create kind of a sense of energy or energetic, energetic space in the painting. And if I take a little bit of white, you know, into my blues, I like to use my two blues for mid-range blue because they sort of mid-range each other out. See, those are complementary colors and they're really vibrant against each other. So that's just, those are wonderful strategies that we can use as artists to really, really be able to bring a lot of drama to our painting. Split complementary color scheme. Ah, again, you don't have to memorize this stuff. That's what the color wheel is for. So you don't have to memorize. You will eventually start to sort of organically think to yourself, you know, I really like these color schemes or this particular color scheme tends to appeal to me. Um, and you'll start to lean into them, but you don't have to memorize them. Right, so in a split color scheme, right, a split complement does not use this. It uses the two colors on either side of the complementary colors. So if I have orange as my complement, I would then use blue, violet, and turquoise, right? If it was just a traditional orange, what if I wanted to do a red orange, which was kind of like where a cad leans anyways, then I would do blue and green. So let's look at this as a split complementary set. And remember, you've got tint, tone, and shade also in there. And remember, if I were to use this green with this red orange, I'm going to be kind of shading it anyways because of the hidden biases and the fact that red and yellow and blue always make a neutralized color. So let's get into our red orange here. Right. It is orange, but it's a red orange. You know, and maybe I want to add some white to that. Right, because I want to have some interesting colors going on there. Making sure that's a nice, nice light color. So that's almost into the peach, right? We've got that sort of like red, orange, orange, peach. And then what other colors do we have? We have blue and green. So for sure, I feel like the ultramarine and the thalo blue is, is my nice favorite sort of middle blue for my palette. You could just use cerulean too. Right, but remember brown is also an orange and so that will get to play into it as well. Right. And I've got green here. And if I want to, I can work um, some lights and darks on that as well. Now I'll add a little yellow to it because my my phthalo green tends to run into the the blue green space and I want it to be more vibrantly green but that's your split color scheme right and I could do some orange and blue mixes and get some nice browns if I wanted to or orange and greens and get some nice browns like if I came here I could add that into that color scheme couldn't I and so I could have some ranges and shadows and a lot happening in a landscape and really be able to paint deserts and you'll see this color scheme a lot in Southwest art. A lot of times you'll see color schemes be regionally used because the environment naturally lends itself to those color schemes, like the types of sunsets, colors of the rocks, color of the environment will pull itself into that color scheme. 
Oh, Patty Hoffman, thank you so much. I appreciate that. So is that like nice? Now, like you could have done, you know, anything. You could do red, violet, green, and yellow. And so that's the split complement. That's a really dynamic thing. Another thing that I would suggest is if you were going to say use a red violet, you would use a lot of red violet in the painting, right? And then just maybe a focal of the yellow and then a little pop of the green. They're all in there, but then you can kind of create focal drama in a piece by also choosing to balance or weight one color more than the others, right? You guys ask me like, what background am I choosing? Well, if I was going to use a split complementary, you know, color scheme, I would pick one of these colors to be the background, probably the red violet, right? And use the splits as the little bits of added on color, right? So that would be, that would be my choice. I'm not saying you couldn't weight it another way, but what you'll find is like if I weight it in the violet and then pop here and the yellow orange and the yellow green, then that's going to create a lot of focal drama. So if you guys are seeing that, and again, I hope you get one of these, if you can get one of these, if you cannot get one of these, they are generally online that you can just print out or reference, right? So it's not like you have, you have to buy one. I think they're useful, but you can find them out there. I'm going to sip some coffee. How are we doing guys? I can't, Patty, I so appreciate you coming by and doing this. And I so appreciate you guys being interested in learning this stuff because it's important stuff. Uh, I think we're going to move on. I'm going to pull my page out so that I have a, a little order in my sketchbook. That's the other reason why I really, really like these Fabrianos. They do this nice thing so beautifully. All right. Split compliment. Now we're going to have fun. A lot of people, and this is one so many people lean into, is the triadic color scheme. Split complement is almost a triadic color scheme. And, 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 but a triadic is using three colors equally spaced from each other on the wheel. The easiest triadic color scheme is the primaries red, yellow, and blue, right? But, right, let's say you wanted to do, I, blue, green is one of my very favorite colors. Blue, green, right, equally spaced. That's the equal distance on the color wheel from each other. So blue, green, yellow, orange, and red, violet is a triadic color scheme. Let's put that out. And again, you're starting to notice that the point of the color orientation tends to be in design. Not always. There are reasons to break this rule. Um, but those are, get a little more comp complicated. And you want to kind of get into the rule first, understand why it works before you start to break it kind of a thing. Right, so here it's like using any color with the two colors on either side of its complement with spit complementary. Triadic is blue, yellow, red, equal distance. See, the equal distance is the one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three between it. So anytime you have the three color ranges between it, that's why you would have triadic. That's where it is. So let's do our blue green because we love a blue green. You know, I love a turquoise. I love a turquoise so much. I'm going to take a little bit of my phthalo blue and phthalo green and make a bit of color here. So let's make a triadic color scheme. Get some nice lighter color. See, so I'm using tinting. I could still use toning and shading in my color scheme. So I do get a lot of range in the colors that I get to use. What's the other one? It is yellow orange. So I'm going to take a little of my yellow over here. And I can even kind of grab a little magenta if I want to use that for my yellow orange. Because you can use any red to make it a yellow orange. It doesn't have to be a cad red. And I'm picking this because I know I'm going to be using the red violet. And by using the red, this is another trick that I'm doing. Kind of think about this. If I've got red violet, I know that I'm tending to use uh, magenta more Then I might use magenta to up my yellow. Does that make sense? It does. Right? 
but if I was using cad red, then I would up my purple with the cad red, and that would still be triadic. I do that in sunsets a lot. I don't know if you guys have ever noticed. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but I do it a lot. And these things start to become kind of organic in our thinking, you know, where we just start to like realize, oh, this is what we're doing. Okay, I'm gonna come here. I'm gonna mix the diox and the quinacridone to create my red violet for this. I have a nice red violet there. Gonna have to put up more white, I can tell. Let's see, that's a triadic color scheme. Isn't that, how it, isn't that dynamic? You can already even tell just in a bar, but if you choose to paint your painting predominantly in a triadic color scheme, that's going to create just a lot of fun and energy. People will respond to it very strongly. You'll see this used a lot in interior design. You'll see it used a lot in garden design and fashion design. Um, go through and look at your fa favorite fashion designers and you'll kind of go, oh, like if, if you like Iris Aprifel, right? Or you're like a Michael Kors person. I don't know who, who you're into or Jean-Paul Gaultier. You will look and you will start to see certain designers across an entire show and in individual garments will lean very strongly into their color theory. If you go to design school, you're going to go into a lot of color theory. That is the core anchor of your design. Right? So this is just a way of thinking about color. How do you pick color? If I was looking at something and I noticed it had a strong color, I might pick a triadic color scheme. And again, my initial advice to you is if the arrow of your, you know, thing tends to point right to this, I kind of use the complement arrow and that's what I will anchor as my heavier color. And that gives me a chance. Not that you can't break that rule. Not that you couldn't anchor into red violet. You couldn't anchor into red orange. But sometimes when you're learning it, you can use that as a way to go, okay, this is where I'm going to lean heavily and I'm just going to pop these two. But you can still lean heavily violet and pop these two. It's, you're never going to go really wrong, especially in triadic because they're equally spaced. We do a triadic in acrylic April. That's the Mondrian piece. Mondrian used that triadic color scheme. Red, yellow, blue. Mm. Yeah. Carly's loving the information and I'm loving Carly for saying so. We are, we're getting there. Oh, tetratic color schemes. All right, so a tetratic color scheme is using a combination of four colors on the color wheel that are two sets of complements, blue and orange and red and green. But basically, it comes out to kind of like, right, kind of like a square. Another way you can do it is like through here. You'll actually start to see it. So it's like, it's, I need the visual guide. I'm going to tell you right now. When I have to make it in my head, I never get there. So I do use a visual guide. So it would be yellow, green, right, and red, violet. So we can check that. Is that, is that a compliment? It is. All right, so let's put that back on our tetradic. And then the other part of the tetradic is yellow, orange, right, and blue, violet. And if we turn the wheel, we'll very quickly see that that is also a complement. So that's what they're saying. So if I do this complement, right, then I'm picking that second set of complements. So if I have yellow green, uh, blue violet, yellow orange, and red violet, it's the way the little square works. It can be more square. It's not about equal distances. It's about the fact that they are two complements on each other. So like if these two and then these two are complements or these two and these two, I think, is where the end of that square goes. It's, it's really quite a mind bend on it. But it's basically the square color range, which ends up being the two complements. Use the guide. That's my advice because it's, it's hard to, like, see. Like, I can sit there and on this side, it's hard to pull it out. On this side, it's really easy to pull it out because it does give you this quick and easy guide. You can also, um, and I tend to do the rectangle more than the square, but 
you can find color guides that help you do this one or you can get print out a wheel and I've done this where I've just traced out where it is where I've got these complements and these complements and oh that's what makes the square right so if this green and red right is there then I have to use that blue and orange and I, I know that and then I can draw up my little square so let's do it all right, so they're often used to create really bold designs. Uh, when you hear someone talking about it's a really bold interior design or it's a bold design. Okay, so if it's a, if it's a red, yellow, green, and blue tends to be the, the tetradic of it. All right, so let's, oh, it didn't do its line. Let's pull out the tetradic color scheme. The most mind... New step, tetradic. And um, when we finally get the school thing for this built up, I have example paintings of that. So it's, so not triadic, tetradic. And believe it or not, these are the basic color schemes. <laughs> it gets crazier than this as you go on, you know. So, all right, let's do yellow green. I love it. I'm going to take this one as my yellow green because I love my lemon yellow and my green. Adding a little more yellow in there. Maybe getting some white involved. So more white involved. All right, just show, showing you guys. So we've got some harmony there, some analogous colors. And then I'm gonna come over here, do, 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 blue, violet, which is this grouping here. Right, a little bit lighter. There we go. And then we have red violet, which we did it from earlier. We can get into this. Making our red violet. It's still distinctly purple. I could have also just gone quinacridone and ultramarine to work through all these colors as well. Would have been super duper fine to do. And then finally, yellow orange. Got to just make sure my brush is completely clean. So when you're working with tetradic color schemes, because it's two sets of complements, one of the things that you'll notice is a challenge and just kind of take a mental note of this in your mind. All right, so there's orange, but I want a yellow orange. So I'm just kind of mixing an orange into my yellow. There you go. So that's a tetradic color scheme. These are just a starting place. But sometimes what you need as an artist is a place to start. Sometimes what you need is a way to anchor a choice in a painting so that you can proceed forward with the rest of the decisions that you're making in the painting. When we go through Acrylic April, we lean on color scheme. A lot of the designs, John would see me pull out my color wheel and have to make a decision about a color scheme to kind of get there. Now, I might have used some more advanced color schemes sometimes because, you know, you got to lean into that. Um, another resource for advanced, more advanced color schemes would be Bob Blast has a really good uh, series on color if you want to, like, go further into this. And I've got a there's a digital artist that does some stuff I really think is quite clever, um, but I don't remember their name off the top of my head. I will think of it and share it eventually. But there's some more resources out there about how these color schemes become more advanced and more like intense. Now the, uh, the final and like kind of last color schemes that you sort of think about that you would go into is like 
another kind of color scheme. You want to give me a new thing? I will. These are just kind of the last basics. A bright color palette. So this can be about not just the other colors that you're using, right? But about creating colors that are super duper luminous right in the world that you're working so if I were to go into this and maybe do a little red the magenta and some pink maybe get a little yellow involved and more white I'll have to put up more white see how bright those colors are right so sometimes in a color scheme what you might do is decide to do very, very bright colors, colors that are super luminous to your eye. You know, almost neon, right? Bright color schemes, using bright colors. Let me uh, put out a little more white. Another very popular color scheme that you can go into is a pastel color scheme. So instead of using colors that are, are very bright like that, right? You would use any colors, but you would add just a ton of white. And that color scheme right can end up very soft and I'm just going through I'm not even rinsing out but you see what I mean about the pastel color scheme how that's its own color scheme um, that often creates a very soft and uh, restful space even if you use colors that are maybe traditionally a little more discordant to each other see how just by them all being in pastel it creates an implied harmony. And the last one of the basic color schemes that we're covering today before we take questions, where did I put my thing, is the neutral color scheme. Um, and this tends to be when you use a lot of browns and uh, blacks and colors that you just think of with earth. So if I take a, a brown here and then I put a little black in my brown Put a little white in that black brown. Get over to my little yellow ochre and I mix that in. Maybe a little more white in my yellow ochre. Do you see how that's a very natural and neutral color scheme? Using browns. So they are not necessarily harmonies because if you think about it yellow ochre is a yellow and brown is an orange and black is a blue so they're not necessarily analogous to each other or next to each other on the color wheel not analogous uh, uh, next to each other on the color wheel so if you look at it black if you think of black as a blue and brown is an orange right that's a bit of a compliment but the yellow ochre is probably a yellow if we look over here. So it's a yellow, an orange, and a blue. See, that doesn't fit any of our color wheel splits, but because they are, you know, kind of in this range, you could do this here, like when you shade things can also create a very neutral color palette where everything is shaded. So that's just a way to go and that can create a nice piece. Um, it actually does a good job in landscapes, I think. And, but also in abstracts, when you use a lot of neutral colors and then you pop a bright color in it, can be really powerful. All right, we get to take some questions before we go.
color schemes. We did them today. Okay. So Thank you, see. Frizzle Girl. So I'm going to put up a, a final step mm -hmm. for the questions. For the questions. Okie dokie. Let's go over here. Um, My palette is like crazy right now. Okay. So uh, if it, so see, first thing here is if I ask, uh, if I, if I stick with Windsor Newton Galleria, will I have many differences? From my paint, a bit, yes. Um, so each paint company has their own formulations on basic colors. So if you take Thalo Blue, Thalo Blue will be the most consistent from company to company. Um, whereas Burnt Sienna will have the most variance, Yellow Ochre, because they are sourced from natural pigments. And depending on where they source, it can greatly change the effect of the pigment. The differences are not enough to throw you out. What will happen, the truth is, is preference. Like some people like really spicy food and some people like mildly spicy food and some people like no spicy food. All those foods are good and they're fine, but we have preferences. So in paint, what you'll find is you will have a preference. Like my favorite quinacridone magenta is golden, golden colors quinacridone magenta. That's my favorite. A lot of good quinacridone magentas out there. Just my favorite happens to be Goldens. Um, I love Matisse, Derivan, and I think their Southern Ocean Blue, which is basically a turquoise, is like one of the best colors out there. And I love their Australian Sienna, which is kind of like an Indian Yellow. Love it. Hate their Ochres. Hate their Burnt Siennas. Do not love the Dioxazine. Right. So I have colors in a, in a line of paint that I will just really adore and colors in a line of paint that I won't like. They are technically the pigments that I'm talking about. They're technically, you know, PB 16 semicolon three, but there's this variance between them based on formulation fillers, the types of polymers they choose to use can affect the luminance of the paint. The way they mill the pigment in can affect the paint. So you will find as a painter that you're like, there's a lot of Mars black, but some Mars black is the blackest black. Right. And others is not as black. It feels um, more gray. And that's about the formulation. I was just asked about the ASTDM numbers on it where it says ASTM and then it has a little number and they were like, is that the, is that the code of paint? What is that? And I'm like, that's the safety code or that's the color compliance code. So they are a voluntary organization that paint companies can participate in where a standard was created. Uh, generally talking to a lot of paint companies and artists saying, this is what Thalo Blue should look like. And this is how long Thalo Blue should last before fading. Those codes generally refer to the accuracy of the color to the agreed upon industry standard, which is voluntary and there isn't an official one. And then also how long the light fastness is. All right. So can you use both complementary and split complementary colors in the same painting? You can. You absolutely can. Um, it, 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 you can use every color on the color wheel in painting. Um, all of this thinking does is gives you a way to make color harmony choices, right? So if I get out, if I do a complement, you know, and I will do this, right? Blue, green, and red, orange, which I would probably do blue, green, red, orange, and I would probably do red over here and orange. And I would think of that as a very Southwest palette. And I would work these colors through their tint tones and shades to create a very kind of Western palette. Um, you absolutely can do that because think about this. This is, these are the analogous colors, aren't they? They're right next to each other. And there's only three of them. And then you've done the complement. That's your pop of color. So that's completely okay. You can use a, you can create a bunch of harmony in your painting by using analogous colors and then picking a complement of one of those colors to create a, what is it? Color surprise, I think is what my mom says. <laughs> color surprise. Yeah. Like the color came up and shocked you. But that's really what it is. If I use all these colors and then I pick a complement to one of these colors, maybe I, you know, use a group. I tend to want to pick the complement, and this was a good natural instinct you had that centers in the center of the, analog of the analogous group. So if I have like say these four 
I'm going to imagine that my complement is somewhere between red, orange, and orange, and is somewhere between blue, green, and blue. That's where I would put that complement here, is between blue, green, and blue, if I wanted to create a like perfect kind of color surprise in that grouping. Okay. So now, sometimes you have to split it in half. It's kind of weird, but it's fun. This question, I'm not exactly sure where this question fit into the things that you were talking about. So okay. If, Stephanie, it, if it doesn't, we will boot it to the next okay, video. Okay. It says, can you repeat how you chose the background again? I don't know what that's referring to. Okay. So yes, I can. Okay. Let's say I'm doing a still life and I've choose to do a split complement, right? On a split complement on my color wheel, you'll notice that the arrow is sort of anchored over here and the weight of the colors in the triangle are weighted here. I will often, just as a default, pick the blue green to be my predominant color and then use these two as the pop of color. It's not that I couldn't use red and pop it, but what I have found is that my greatest preferential visual harmony comes from if I were to use the strongest, act, like the strongest weight of the triadic of the split complement, there. On triadic, I mean they're kind of equal distance, so you, so you can do either way. I sometimes will still use this part of the wheel as it, but you don't really have to as much. But it can help you make a decision. Another way that I choose the background, if I've set a still life and I've taken a picture and there's a lot of blue, like I've draped a lot of blue cloth, right? Well then I, and I wanna do like a split complement, then I'm gonna set my split complement here and I'm gonna use these two as my um, split complements and weight it heavily blue. And that can also help you design the still life. If you're like, how do I design a still life? You can use this wheel and say, well, I'm gonna drape a bunch of blue fabric and I'm gonna pick a bunch of red, orange and yellow, orange flowers. It's not that you won't have green and other colors in your still life, you will, but you know that you're gonna lean on that color palette strongest. Gotcha. So, uh, some other questions mm -hmm. that have been asked. Yay, I love questions. Uh, Amy was saying, you said it's safe to wash your brushes with Sherpa soap. Yes, it should be safe to wash your brushes with Sherpa soap. Why are you I'm now worried about that? No, no, just, I just, that's what it's for. Yes, that's, that's, that's for totally, not, it's, it's not for your face. <laughs> yeah, it's totally for using brushes. Yeah, you're, you're yeah, totally It's for good. brushes. Sherpa soap is not for your hands. It's for your brushes. It's, it's for, for brushes. synthetic brushes and acrylic paint. Yeah. You can wash your hog brushes with it because it gets the acrylic out thoroughly. Um, with with oil, oil brushes and watercolor brushes where you have a natural hair, you tend to want to use a gentler, you don't barely need any soap for that anyways, but you want to use gentler things, you know, you're protecting and conditioning the hair. With synthetic brushes, right, you're, you're not going to do that. You just don't want to use an acetone on it and melt it. And the Sherpa soap has both an essential oil uh, formulation uh, based actually on, on Renaissance <laughs> painting and also a uh, the soap formulation itself breaks down the acrylic paint. So not only the essential oils, because it's like 10 times orange and lavender spike oil, not lavender, lavender spike oil. So those things are traditionally used to break up pigments and clean up paint. And then on top of it, it helps break up the acrylic polymers in it. And it really just pulls it out of the ferrule of your brush and cleans it. And even if it's a little bit dry on there, a lot of times you can get it out. A lot of people have really like saved brushes with it. We will have more soap in the store soon. We are partnering with a new soap maker to be able to meet the demands. Because yes. you guys go through a lot of soap and our home bat where we make it at home, cure our, it for a bunch of months and put it up for sale is not meeting the demand. So a we large found garage somebody... production facility was not sufficient with a dedicated kitchen. So the, the challenge to the Sherpa soap has been this. You take the soap formulation to somebody and they see the cost of 10 times orange oil. Or they see the cost of lavender spike oil and they go, uh, why don't you just use some lavender or orange? They're always trying to change the formulation or change what you're thinking. And it was it just took us a minute to find a company who was like, they, we sent them samples of the soap and they were the ones who came back and they're like, this is fascinating what you guys have made here. I was like, this is a really good bar of soap. This is a really good bar of soap and it would do exactly what you thought it would do. And they agreed to get the ingredients the way we asked and follow the yep. formulation the way that we asked them to follow the formulation. And I mean, yeah, I do have some pretty smell stuff in there like bergamot and things that I personally like to smell. But, you know. Cloves is for cleaning. Right? Okay. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pause just gonna ask you a, a behind the scenes question. Mm. Hold on a second here. Uh, 
Um, yeah, okay, let's go to muted. Facebook for the store. All right, yeah. now we're out. Now we're okay. live. So here's what we're going to do. First, I want to I want to thank so Stephanie many for saying about you and your mom are amazing teachers. I love the way you teach. What does it mean when a brush has a series? Thank you for all you do. Okay. A series brush. A series brush. So there's the brush company Raphael. And in that brush company Raphael, they have the series soft acryl. And then they also have uh, the is acryl. And then they also have the textura. And interestingly enough, a number 12 Raphael and the textura may not be the same as in the different series of brushes. It's mayhem out there. But that's what they're talking about is this here. And in paint, when they're talking about series, they're talking actually about the pigments and stuff that's used in it. And whether it's a student or a mid-grade or a professional paint in the cost in. So like a series one paint in professional paints will cost less money than a series nine. And sometimes in brushes, they will use that scale too. So like a series one in Windsor and Newton will be a cheap brush, but their series seven is a, is a, a Kalinsky Sable, which you can't even get anymore. And it's $500. So that's another way series. So a series could be the line of brushes and a series can also be the quality differential between the materials used in a professional line of either paint or brushes. You'll find it sort of used those two ways. Again, as mentioned before, there's only voluntary standards, no industry standards. People just do what they feel when they make art supplies. And that's okay, because we're artists, so we learn how, we, you know what? We can deal with creative choices. Let's, we have a lot of questions about the Art Sherpa store, which is open now, and there's been some cool, exciting changes. Um, we finally got the tech team came back from the weekend, and so we got some stuff going. Uh, let's meet over on Facebook. I have a Facebook page, The Art Sherpa. It's not the group. That's our private little haven where we all get together and share art safely. Not my personal page, which says Cinnamon Cooney, where I might share opinions that I have about life. The Art Sherpa official page, where I just let you know what's coming up on the schedule and give you inspirational quotes <laughs> on Facebook. So it's just Facebook, you know, dot com slash the art Sherpa. That's where we're going to go. And we'll talk about the store. I don't know what we're going to talk about, but we'll answer all the questions about the store over there. If you had any questions about purchases, deals, the prices, why it's so good, we can give you all the deets on that. Guys, our next class is Thursday. We are actually color mixing on Thursday. So bring your paints again and the colors for Acrylic April. We're going to color mix. And then on the weekend, we have a very uh, involved Renaissance bunny to paint because I just wanted to get it done before we did a bunch of abstract paintings. And then Tuesday, we have palette knife and a couple, uh, I'll throw in some abstract techniques that we're going to be using, but it's going to be about how to use a palette knife. So meet me over on Facebook right now. And I want you guys to be good to yourselves, good to each other. And I'll see you at Facebook real soon. <laughs> Bye-bye. Step eight. I don't know why he didn't do that. What are you to... doing? I'm going to get my coffee. See, watch You're this. so I weird. I do this, and then go this, so and then it goes away. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.